in this video we're going to talk about three different types of series. The first type is called telescoping. This is when you start writing out this plus that plus that plus that and a bunch of cancellations occur. And that's why it's called telescoping. We'll talk about a little bit more details as we go through the video. The second type is called a geometric series. You might remember from the previous video, geometric sequences. This is going to be the same format with r to the n power, but this is going to be for series where the individual terms are being added up. We're going to establish some rules for geometric series for when they converge and when they diverge, and we'll work through some examples. The third type is called the integral test. Remember Riemann sums from the beginning of the course? Actually, a series with a1 plus a2 plus a3 plus a4, is that's actually a Riemann sum, right? So we're going to draw a little picture, and I'm going to show you how that works. Works. And what that allows us to do is convert a summation into an integration. And then we're going to do an improper integral and go from there. We'll get into the details. So let's get to it. One crucial concept that we're going to use in this video is the nth partial sum of a series. That's the summation of the first n terms. If my indexing started at 0, then in order to get n terms, I'd have to add up a0, a1, up to a n minus 1. If my indexing started at some random number like like a5, then in order to get n terms, I would have to sum up a5, a6, and then keep going until the indexing ended at 5 plus n minus 1. That way, in total, I have n terms. No matter what the indexing is, the nth partial sum is the first n terms. Any series, if you replace this infinity on top with an n and then take the limit as n goes to infinity, then you can utilize your formula for the nth partial sum, and then you can take the limit of the resulting partial sums. If that limit does not exist, then the series diverges. If the limit does exist, then the series converges to the value of the limit. We're going to tackle telescoping series using partial sums. Here's our first example. In order to get a grasp of what's going on, let's write out the first couple of terms here. If k is equal to 1, then the first term here is a half minus a fourth. Now let's write out the k equals 2 term, a third minus a fifth, k equals 3, etc. Now what I'm trying to do is get a form formula for the nth partial sum. So I would like to have n terms here, where n is an unspecified integer. As you can see for demonstration purposes, I've plugged in k equals n and also k equals n minus 1 into the formula. Now let's see what happens. We have minus a fourth here and plus a fourth canceling out. Minus a fifth and plus a fifth cancel out. Minus a sixth will cancel out with plus a sixth. As you can see, we didn't write that term, but if you follow the pattern, Pattern, you can see that that will happen. Each term is getting canceled two k values later. If you follow that pattern, you can also determine that these first terms will be canceled two terms prior. This one will be canceled from two terms prior. Pause the video and make sure to follow the pattern yourself in order to see the cancellations. That's what the word telescoping is meant to describe, is these cascade of cancellations from one term to the next. Now what's left over that's not being canceled? We have the initial term here of a half, this third never gets cancelled, and we have a few coming from the end as well that do not get cancelled. So there we go. That's our formula for the nth partial sum. If we take the limit as n goes to infinity, that will be the value of the series. Those two terms approach zero, and the value of the limit is 5 sixths in this case. And the whole summation ends up adding up to 5 sixths. The next topic is geometric series. A geometric series generally has this format, r to the k, where r is a constant and k starts at k equals 0 and continues summing these terms as k goes to infinity. We're going to go through a little proof in order to classify what happens for different types of r values. You will not be expected to reproduce these proofs, but it's going to give you a little bit of background so that once I tell you what the rules are for geometric series, you can see where those rules came from. First, let's consider the case if the absolute value of r is greater than 1. Remember in the last video, we had a rule that says for geometric sequence, in other words, the individual terms in the summation, that limit will not exist if the absolute value of r is greater than 1. The limit of the individual terms does not approach 0. So the divergence test tells us that this series diverges in that case. Let's next consider the case of r is equal to positive 1. Again, the individual terms would be 1 to the k. 1 to any power is still 1. So the limit of the individual terms is 1. And again, that's not equal to 0. So by the divergence test, the summation of those terms must diverge. Case r equals negative 1. 
this oscillates plus one minus one plus one minus one etc the value of this limit does not exist again by the divergence test the series diverges in that case too so we've got diverges by the divergence test if the absolute value of r is either greater than one or equal to one so now i've got that summarized on the top here now let's consider the case of the absolute value of r being less than one we're going to use the partial sum method now this geometric series starts with an indexing at k equals zero so the first term is r to the zero which is one next term is r to the one next term is r to the two if we want the first n terms we're going to have to go up to r n minus one now here's a trick that we're going to use let's multiply the nth partial sum times r as you can see each individual term here has gotten multiplied times an extra r now we're going to subtract bottom line from the top line we see r canceling with r r squared canceling with r squared and r to the n minus one will cancel with r to the n minus 1. What are we left with? We're left with 1 minus r to the n for the terms that don't cancel. Now again, we're doing a little trick here. Let's factor out sn on the left side of the equation. Now divide by 1 minus r on both sides, and here we go. This is our formula for the nth partial sum. All of this work that we did here, you may not have understood why the heck we were doing it. It's basically a trick that works for geometric series. That's a good thing to know if, say, you're a math major and you're going to continue on in math courses. And we can take the limit as n goes to infinity for the nth partial sum in order to figure out whether the series converges or diverges. Go check out geometric sequences from the previous video. If the absolute value of r is less than 1, then the limit of r to the n power will approach 0 as n goes to infinity. So our conclusion here is that the geometric series in question, as long as the absolute value of r is less than 1, then the series will converge to the value given by 1 over 1 minus r. That's the proof of our results. Geometric series diverges is if the absolute value of r is greater than or equal to 1, and it converges to 1 over 1 minus r if the absolute value of r is less than 1. Your job is to apply these rules in examples. The arguments I gave on the previous slides proving these rules, I just wanted to show you so you understand where the rules are coming from. A geometric series has a number in the base, which we usually call r, and it's it's raised to the value of k here, which is the indexing of the sequence. The indexing of this sequence is called n. It doesn't really matter. You just need a number in the base and the indexing up in the exponent in order to be called a geometric series. So let's do the algebra. We're separating the powers here. We are remembering that powers raised to powers get multiplied. Remember that 3 to the 3 is 27. 2 to the 5 is 32. Also this 2 to the minus one power is coming into the denominator so it looks slightly simpler. This two here is getting pulled out in front as a constant in front of the series and we're gathering this part together as 32 over 27 quantity raised to the n power. Aha! That's exactly what we were looking for. As you can see if we follow the rules 32 over 27 has an absolute value greater than 1 so the answer here is that this series given in this example diverges. That's how we use these rules. We just do the algebra, we match up the format, we see whether r is greater than 1 or less than 1, and then we conclude based on the rules that we derived in the previous slide. Let's do another. As you can see, I introduced an extra complication into this example. These rules that we determined where it converges to 1 over 1 minus r really relied on the format where it starts at k equals 0. So if this one starts at n equals 2, we're going to have to do a slight adjustment of the indexing. This is one of the key things that you need to learn how to do with series. In addition to the previous example, which is kind of like basic algebra, moving the powers around, simplifying things, collecting things, blah, 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 right? We also need to learn how to fix the indexing. So let's do that in this example. I wish the indexing started at zero, but currently it starts at two. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the indexing of n and I'm gonna subtract two from n and get a new indexing of k. As you can see, if n starts at 2, then k starts at 0. Just plug that in. You can see it. 2 minus 2 is 0. And we're going to transition this whole summation into a bunch of stuff with k's instead of a bunch of stuff with n's. Add 2 to the other side, and you get that n is equal to k plus 2. Everywhere in this formula, you're going to replace the n's with k plus 2. So let's do this. n equals 2 
corresponds to k equals 0. We've got pi, so we're getting k plus 2 minus 1. We're replacing this n with k plus 2. Now let's just simplify a little bit. k plus 2 minus 1 is the same thing as k plus 1. And now here, don't forget that 3 squared is 9. Now we can do similar to the previous problem. Let's separate the powers. This pi and the 9 squared, those guys have nothing to do with k. If there's no k's in it, then it's a constant and you can pull it out in front of the sum. And then pi to the k over 9 to the k is getting collected into one big quantity, pi over 9 to the k power. And now we're basically done because this is a geometric series. That's exactly the format I wish that I had in the beginning, starting at k equals 0. This is one big number raised to the k power. That's an r value of pi over 9, so this r value is certainly less than 1. This series converges to 1 over 1 minus r. Now putting it all together for the final answer, pi over 81 times the quantity 1 over 1 minus r, where the r value is pi over 9. Get the answer as simple as possible, although any of these things in the box could be fine for the final answer. Let's move on to the integral test. The integral test is a rule. If the sequence is positive and decreasing, in other words, if the dots here on the graph of the sequence are positive and they are decreasing, and if you can find a function that kind of fills in, in other words, replaces ends with x's, then the series and the integral either both converge or they both diverge. Okay, now why the heck does that work? I'm going to explain it to you so that you have the background. Let's look at the summation. If I just put 1 times a1, now this is like a rectangle. The base is 1, and the height of the rectangle here is a1. Now this looks like a Riemann sum. As you can see, the value of that Riemann sum is an overestimation for the value of the integral of the f of x function. Now let's consider the right-handed Riemann sum. If it's right-handed, then the first rectangle is going to start at a2. As you can see, the value of the series underestimates the integral. Okay, so summarizing, if I start summing at n equals 1, that one's going to be an overestimation. On the other hand, if I start summing at n equals 2, that's like an underestimation of the integral, according to this picture. Let's look at this. If the integral converges to an actual number, then the series part, which is an even smaller than that, must be also some sort of number, so it also converges. On the other hand, if the series converges, starting at n equals 1 for the white series here, then that converges to some sort of number, and the integral is something less than that number, so the integral would have to converge as well. We can just keep continuing with this logic. Suppose that the integral diverged. That means that this blue part here would have to be infinity which means that the series would have to be bigger than infinity, so the series would have to also diverge. And finally, suppose that the series diverge. Then the integral would have to be bigger than infinity based on this inequality, so the integral would have to also diverge. So summarizing these four bullets, whatever the series does, the integral also does the same thing, and vice versa. Okay, so that's the logic. That's the reason why the integral test is true. Okay, let's look at a concrete example here. As you can see, none of the previous tests that we learned actually works on this series. For example, let's try the divergence test. The limit of the individual terms of the sum is equal to zero. So unfortunately, the divergence test doesn't apply here. Take a look at this thing. You can kind of like write down a couple of terms. It's definitely not telescoping. There's no like cascading cancellations like we had in the first example. So that's not going to work. And finally, it's definitely not G geometric, we don't have just a number to the n power. Here we get square root of the n, which is completely different than a geometric series. Okay, so I just wanted to convince you that none of the methods that we learned so far actually work for this series, except for the integral test. In order to double check that the integral test is applicable, the individual terms are positive and decreasing. You can see that as n increases, the a n's decrease, and surely these things are positive. So yes, the integral test does apply. In order to apply the integral test, we basically
basically switch all the ends into x's and we switch the summation to an integral sign. The limits of integration just come from the indexing from 1 to infinity. This is an improper integral. Let's first do the antiderivative. This is a substitution problem with u equals negative square root of x. There we go. Okay, now in order to do this improper integral, we're going to plug in t, plug in 1, and subtract, and then take the limit as t approaches infinity. There we go. Remember that if the exponent in here approaches negative infinity, then the exponential approaches 0. Our final answer is 2 over e for the value of the integral. Okay, so the integral test says that as long as the integral converges, the series also converges. The first topic was telescoping series. You write out some terms, and you should see cascading cancellations. Then, you find a formula for the nth partial sum and take the limit as n goes to infinity to see if the series converges or diverges. The second type is the geometric series. If you have numbers raised to the n power, that indicates that it's a geometric series. And what you have to do is exactly match this format of starting at n equals 0 and going up to infinity. You're going to have to use a little bit of algebra, possibly changing the indexing. Then you just follow the rules. If the absolute value of r is greater than or equal to 1, then that geometric series diverges. And if the absolute value of r is less than 1, then the geometric series converges to 1 over 1 minus r. And finally, we did the integral test. First, you're going to verify that the terms of the series are positive and decreasing. Then you can replace n's with x's. Replace the summation with an integral. Calculate the integral. And then if the integral converges, then the series converges, and if the integral diverges, then the series diverges. Review each one and bring your questions into class. So I hope you enjoyed this video on three different types of series. They're all very, very different. One thing that you might think about before you come to class is wrestling through the book and finding extra examples. Can you identify, oh, that one's going to be telescoping because things are going to cancel. Oh, that one's geometric because it's r to the n. Identifying which series Series fall under which type of test is going to be one of your biggest challenges for this chapter. I'll see you in class.